Yes. Yes. I have um, something that I want to tell you. Uh, this is Jolanda. Jolanda. <laughs> uh, she's the aunt of a kid who's uh, in, in uh, ICE custody. Uh, he's in a prison in Texas. He was apprehended because he crossed the border illegally. Uh, and since he didn't have any papers, he, uh, he wasn't lucky enough to, to be able to come north of the U.S. He got uh, apprehended in Texas. Uh, what's happening right now is that he is going to be deported very soon. Unless we find, we find a sponsor. The sponsor is somebody who's, who would be willing to write, I mean, to sign a letter saying that he, this person who uh, would accept to be a sponsor, would take care of him in terms of not being a problem for the U.S. government. So, in other words, if this person would be uh, not able to work, or would be sick, or things like that, the, this person would take care of him, and the U.S. government wouldn't have to pay a cent. Now, uh, his name is Agnes Oliva, and uh, he's a really hard worker. Jolanda uh, works for me sometimes. He comes and cleans up my uh, house, and it's wonderful. He's, she's super, super incredibly uh, hard worker, and her, her uh, nephew is the same way. The reason why he got out of uh, Honduras was because, first of all, the gangs in Honduras were trying to recruit him to sell drugs, and he didn't want to. And they said, well, if you don't want to be a uh, part of our gang, uh, we're going to have to kill you, kill your mom and your dad and your uh, siblings. And uh, so, and the other thing is that uh, his mom is a uh, single mom. He has four siblings, and uh, they don't really have a, a steady place that they can work. So he came here to try to make some money, send it home, but unfortunately he got caught. So if by any chance you know of anybody who would be interested in being a sponsor, I try to be a sponsor, but I don't make enough money. You have to be able to make in between $27,000 to $30,000 free of the taxes to be able to, to uh, be a sponsor. I don't make that much. So, if you know of anybody, uh, please let me know. Let Sally know. She, she is helping us very, very uh, intensely, which I really, really appreciate. And hopefully we can keep him in this country. Thank you. 21. And I think this may be something that if somebody would be willing to say, you know, I would be the point person for this, that we as a congregation could come around and support the person. Um, but we need one person to say, you know, I'm willing to kind of, to be that person. So if you're interested, let's pray about it and then let us know. Um, immigration continues to be a huge issue in this country, as we all know. And um, next Sunday, vote common good. It's an organization that's going around the country doing a documentary and doing a tour on um, immigration rights and the things that face people on the border. They did a bicycle ride from Seattle down the California coast, across the U.S. border, and ended up in Florida. Um, and like I said, that's part of the documentary. But they're just talking to people on the border, getting what's going on, really trying to figure out and put together what is it like on the border in the U.S. So many of us don't understand what's really going on. Um, they're going to be at Jacob's Porch next Sunday from 5.30 to 7, and then worship there will be at 7, so if anybody's interested in hearing them, again, they, they take on issues. They're not really political. They're just trying to get facts out to people so that people can vote for the common good. That's kind of their mission. Um, so if you're interested, please, um, and you need to know where Jacob's Porch is or anything, see me, but there will be a Jacob's Sunday at 5 30. We are actually taking a meal for the Jacob's Porch meal next week. So I'd love to have a couple of you there to kind of help get things ready. Huh? Where? 
at Jacob's Forge, which is on campus, on the Ohio State's campus. Yeah, it's on campus. One, two, house, and one, two. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have that. I'll help. I'll help. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then also, we have the mail this Thursday. So if a couple of people could show up right between 4.30 and 5 and help us get the meal ready at 5.30, that would be fantastic. Brandon will hopefully be there, and I think Bill and Kathy will be there. But if we could get a couple more. Yes? Is it 5.30 now? Five yeah, the meal switched to 5.30. So if you could still get here around 4.30, 5 o'clock, that would be great. The meals have switched an hour back. Uh, because of daylight savings time. We moved it forward.
7. I am the Lord God who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these. He cut them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not put the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun goes down, when the sun had gone down, and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
Amen? All right. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for keeping your promises. Thank you for keeping your promises. And giving us a big family full of faith for the good times and bad times.
that was child. And Abram's become so fixated on his problem, his childlessness, that he's finding it hard to trust God anymore. How often do we reside in that same space that Abram is in? We do our best to be what God tells us to be. We do our best to do what God tells us to do. We try to be faithful. We're trusting in all God's promises. But instead of things getting easier for us, things actually get harder. And we think, God, what good are your promises if all they're going to do is make my life harder? I think this story makes clear to us this morning that God doesn't have the same timetable we have. When God promises something, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen now. I think our story for Genesis this morning also lets us know that sometimes we just need to be patient and continue to trust. But I also think this story shows us that we can trust God even when we are frustrated. We don't have to tiptoe around God's feelings when we feel that God is the keeping of his end of the bargain. We can go to God in prayer and say, God, things aren't going the way you said they would. They are going the way you promised God. So what's up? It is okay to make your problems God's problems. Abram definitely did. Abram complained to God, and far from being angry, God responds with yet another promise. God says to Abram, not only will you have an heir, and your descendants will be numerous, but you're going to occupy this land. Despite Abram's impatience and doubt, God makes Abram this promise. Not just for descendants, but for the land. And we're told that Abram believed in God, and God counted it as righteousness. Yeah. Now we could just stop here with this message this morning. Simple sermon, happy ending, good story. And many do stop. But this week I read something by Justin Michael Reed, an Old Testament professor at Louisville Seminary, who's an African-American gentleman that made this point about the story. He said, and I quote, we usually describe Abram's main problem in this passage as lack of children, but the real issue is not what he lacks. Abram's problem, problem is his prejudice stops him from seeing what's right in front of him. Abram does not complain just about not having children. Abram also says to the Lord, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house is going to be my heir. It was the custom in Abram's time that when a man of worth had no children, he would take a slave from his household, and that slave would act as a son would act, meaning he would take care of the man in his old age, he would make sure the man was properly buried, the slave would look after the property when the man no longer could, and as part of the bargain, the slave would then inherit as a son would inherit. Does Abram's urgency and worry about being childless stem from the fact that God hasn't kept his promise? Or does it instead come from the fear that a slave would inherit his property? Good question, isn't it? I included verses 13 and 16 in our reading today. The part about how after Abram falls into a deep sleep in the middle of this ceremony, God says to Abram, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country that is not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Of course, God is talking about the Hebrew captivity in Egypt that lasted roughly 430 years. Captivity from which Moses would liberate them. It's a story we read about in Exodus. I included these verses in our first reading this morning since the lectionary leaves them out. And I included them because I hope they help you see the irony that Dr. Reed is pointing out. Abram does not want a slave to inherit, but Abram's descendants will be slaves. And not only will they endure slavery, they will come to understand slavery as part of their identity. Because over and over, God will identify himself by saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
Jesus knows the real problem is not that Herod wants to kill him. Instead, the real problem is, is that people can't see what's right in front of them. They cannot see who Jesus is. They cannot see Jesus as the Son of God. They cannot see that he has come to change the world. They cannot see that he has come to save them. Herod, like so many people that come before him, cannot seem to understand that their behavior, that what they do and how they think and what they believe is the reason why Jesus had to come in the first place. They can't see that what they desire is the exact opposite of God's desire for the world. Herod, like so many others, doesn't understand that the way he is living his life will eventually destroy him.
body was actually even evil. And the idea that God would be raised from the dead and come back to inhabit a human body was unthinkable. And because of that, they found it really hard to believe in the resurrection. So Paul wrote to them and said this, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still dead to in your sins, and those who died in Christ have also perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. The message puts it this way. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a sorry lot. I feel the same about the things that are said about and believed about Christ today. If all we get out of this faith is the ability to feel superior over others, if all it is is about feeling good because we go to church once a week, if all we get out of our faith is a little peace of mind that we need to go to heaven, then we too are to be most pitied. Just this week, a friend of mine who is a Lutheran pastor called me to tell me about a person we both worked with a few years ago. He told me that this person was kicked out of his church, a Lutheran church, in which he was very active, a church in which he worked tirelessly, because it was found out that he was a convicted and registered sex offender for a crime that happened over 20 years ago when he was a teenager. Now, I don't know the whole story, I don't know the details about what he did, but I do know that when I met him, he was a wonderful person. He's married, he has a child, and I'm guessing he has repented and changed his life because he had a strong faith in God. But even if all he hadn't done all that, does it matter? I'm guessing that the church was acting on what they thought was the problem. Because 
exists only because people simply don't understand what poverty looks like, or what being a minority looks like, or what mental health issues look like. As a society, we do not know our neighbors' needs. When I think of the people in prison, the society is just thrown away. I have to believe God is weeping. As a supposed Christian nation, we should know better. Because it's right in front of us. Yet so many cannot see what God is up to in this world. So many do not understand what God tells us in his word. How do we not see the benefits of caring for one another? How do we not understand that everything we have is simply on loan to us as a gift from God? How do we think money will save us? How do we not think that the very best way to care for one another is to invite them and show them the love of Jesus Christ? Amen. How do we not understand the love, that love, and the love only is what we are called by God to do? God makes it quite simple. Love everyone. Because God loved you first. Share with everyone, because God shared with you first. Have you ever thought God wants us to love our neighbor? Because at some point, it might be us in need. It might be us that has fallen through the cracks. Jesus' message is not always a popular message, but it is the truth. And the fact that we can't see the wisdom and the truth in God's word as a world and as a nation, as the people of God, is going to come back to bite us. Let us live as people who know and believe that the God who created this universe loves us so much that he was willing to die for us. Let us let the knowledge that we are so deeply loved by God give us the courage to open our eyes to really see the world in need, to speak about what we know, and to continue to pray that God uses us to change the world. May we have the courage to look beyond the things that frustrate us, to look beyond the easy fix, and instead to always strive to identify the real problem that God is trying to show us. Amen.
tell people about you, dear Lord. Do not be afraid. Dear Lord, Lord, I now offer this time for others to offer their prayers silently for a while. Right now, Lord, you said count it all joy. 
forward. 